This modular sculpture tutorial will show you how to use modules, which are small standardized units, to form a larger, more complex composition, which is your modular sculpture. This is an abstract, non-objective sculpture technique, and it's great for learning the basics. How to use repetition, how to create unity, and how to create stable structures that don't topple over. If you love learning about art, hit that subscribe button so you never miss an art tutorial. Today I'm using craft sticks or popsicle sticks to create a modular sculpture. There's a lot of different ones to choose from and a modular sculpture is made up of a series of modules or shapes that are created over and over again focusing on geometric shapes, which means straight lines and edges. You can also do this with toothpicks. It will take longer, they're tiny, they kind of roll around a little bit, but you can choose any material that you have multiples of that has a straight edge. There are so many different types of glue to use. Um, you could use wood glue, Elmer's glue, hot glue, super glue. I'm using Elmer's glue because it's cheap, it's affordable, I have lots of it, and it dries quick enough and it dries clear. So that is what I'm using, and you could use any glue that you have your hands on, but that's what makes sense in my public school world. With my popsicle sticks, I'm playing around with modules, which are my standardized units that I will use to create more complex compositions. I'm leaning towards a triangle because I know that's a very stable shape, but you could do something more square or rectangular, diamond, parallelogram. Because it's a geometric shape, you don't have unlimited options, but you'd be surprised at how creative you can get with just a few craft sticks and some glue. So there's some ideas for you. Play around with what you want to create. And again, I'm sticking with the triangle because I know that is the most stable shape for building. I'm using my Elmer's glue. This one's clear, but you might have um, the glue that's white. Again, you might be using a glue, um, a hot glue gun already. It's just hot glue gun sticks are kind of expensive. It's not something I have for every student, so that's why I'm using just old-fashioned glue here. And I'm gonna start by just creating my standardized units, my modules, and I'm going to repeat the same shape over and over again. I'm gonna set a goal for making close to 10 of these. I want my sculpture to be tall and have interest. So I'm just gonna repeat these steps making similar triangles um, that I will then create my more complex structure. Let's time lapse this since I'm just repeating the same module over and over again with the same technique. Once you have the right amount, it's time to make a decision. Do I paint my modules first? Do I build a sculpture and then paint it? And let me just go ahead and tell you, both solutions are annoying. So the easiest thing you could do is spray paint once the sculpture is 100% built. Spray paint is expensive. My classes have 39 students in them. So we are hand painting our sculptures and some of my ch students chose to paint the popsicle sticks um, first. Some students chose um, because I told them to, to build the sculpture and then paint, and some students did a combination of the two. I'm gonna try out painting my modules first, and again, you can see there's paint getting on my hand. It is a 3D shape, it's flat, but it's still a raised surface enough that you do have to get in the cracks, crevices, and the sides. So I'm still on the fence about which is more annoying, hand painting each one or painting it after it's constructed. Again, spray paint is the easiest, fastest solution, but if you're in the public school, uh, school world like me, mm, it's just not always in the budget. Adding a little water to your brush, a little water, will make the paint spread out, and if you're using craft sticks like me, it will absorb it nice and beautifully. If your paint looks patchy, you can go over it a second time, and acrylic paint dries much faster than you think. I'm using black because I know it's universally forgiving. If you're using a light color like white, yellow, pink, something like that, you're, it might take more than one coat. So keep in mind every color is a little bit different. Also notice I got smart and I'm using my pencil to hold down each of my modules so I don't get paint all over my fingers. So let's time lapse this bad boy because again, just like you watching me glue them, you don't need to watch me paint all of them one solid color. This whole process took me probably 20 minutes. Um, I started by painting one side, letting it dry, and then flipping it. But it dried so fast that I started just flipping it and painting both sides at a time. And you can always re-glue or add more modules as you go. Now, it is time to actually create or construct our modular sculpture. So we're gonna join together our modules, our standardized units, to form a larger, more complex sculpture. 
If you painted first, make sure your paint is dry and you will need some sort of base to attach your pieces to. I'm using cardboard. I didn't paint it first because I'm going to show you what to do if you choose to paint your modules after you constructed it. And the base is going to be the most important part. You want your sculpture to be free standing, balanced and stable on its own without you having to prop it up. So I'm gonna lean two uh, modules together. Three or four would be the most stable structure, but because they're so light, I feel pretty comfortable just with the two. You can see they almost stand up by themselves with just one side glued. Um, you're gonna see I'm very impatient. Things move around a lot. Um, I don't have a lot of finesse when it comes to sculpture. I'm a little, yep, there it goes. I'm a little bit of a spaz. So take a deep breath, go slow. The hot glue dries quickly, um, but it doesn't dry instantly. So the taller you get, the slower you have to go to make sure that your stable or your sculpture is actually stable and balanced. It's also important to find a way to create balance and structure in your sculpture without using so much hot glue that it becomes just a mess. Hot glue is great because it works fast. It's very binding, very effective, but it does kind of have a messy, gloppy look to it. So you have to find the balance of how much glue to use versus how to not make your sculpture look messy or too glued up. Um, so the next step, and I am kind of playing around knowing that I want my glue to dry at the bottom a little bit. Now that I have my base down at the bottom, how do I want to extend to go up to the next part of my sculpture? You want your sculpture to not just be balanced, but you want it to be interesting from all sides and angles. So that is called in the round. And that is when a sculpture is interesting from all sides and has a 360 degree viewpoint, not just like a flat sculpture, like a relief sculpture. So it's important to turn your sculpture as you go, making sure it doesn't just go straight up and down, but it kind of moves and bends throughout different planes. There she goes, she's falling. So kind of find your balance and hot glue is very hot, so don't touch it. And I did have to tell a high school student once, don't lick the hot glue gun. Didn't think those words would ever come out of my mouth, but you know, public school life. Um, and if you're gonna hold it in place, just make sure you're not touching the hot glue. That, that's pretty obvious, but if you do it once, which I've done it so many times, you'll learn your lesson quickly. You can see I'm trying to be really patient here, especially because this is the first piece that I'm attaching from the base. So this is gonna really hold and support a lot of the sculpture as I move forward. As I'm moving up, I'm just puzzle piecing my sculpture together, focusing on balance, focusing on movement, um, and really trying to pay attention to all sides. This is an example of abstract sculpture, so it's not supposed to represent anything. It's non-objective. Non-objective art is non-representational. It tends to be geometric, and it's not trying to specify specific objects or subjects from the natural world. You're just focusing on the arrangement of the elements of art. So that would be your shapes, that would be your balance, your repetition, and it's not trying to represent something in particular. That's important to keep in mind. I'm gonna speed things up to double time because what you're seeing me do is just problem solve with all the things I said before. Attaching pieces that are visually interesting without the whole sculpture toppling. The beauty of non-objective art is that you can kind of go with it. It doesn't have to represent anything, so you don't have to have an end goal besides it not falling over and being interesting from all sides. So I'm just gonna kind of speed things along a little bit. Um, I'm just playing around with attaching my modules, letting the glue dry before I go too tall. So keep in mind, the taller you go, the more fragile it will be. And if you extend off to one side, consider adding a counterbalance or a weight on the other side so it's not leaning to one edge. You'll learn the hard way um, if you attach something too heavy or you go like off in one direction without it being balanced. Now, I'm using cardboard for a base. If you use a heavier surface like a block of wood or anything that's heavier, you'll have more balance from the base and it's less likely to topple over. So when you're making a 3D work of art, it's all about balance. It's all about figuring out weights and which direction you can lean towards, but with counterbalancing on the other side. At this point, I kind of have this one piece left. I know you're looking at the aerial view. You're looking at the top view of the sculpture. Let me show you what some of my students have done. So this is the first batch of students, and I believe they had worked on this one or two class periods. You can see that none of them have been painted. That was the way we did it for this class. And you can see there's several different approaches. Some of them are really organized and geometric. Some have a little bit more movement to them.
This was actually before we had a class competition to see how big or how tall we could get them. Two of my students currently have three feet tall modular sculptures. We'll see if they stand over the weekend and don't fall over. So you can really go a lot of different directions with this. You can paint them any way that you would like. So again, this is me double time speeding things up, just kind of getting all my modules in place before I do my final paint job. Now you were looking at this from an aerial view directly down on it. So it's really hard to kind of see and understand because you wouldn't look at this sculpture from an overhead angle. You'd be looking at it like on a base where you could walk around it and see it from all sides. So at the end of this video, I will do a 360 view of the sculpture where it's not an aerial view, but this kind of gives you an idea of how the construction is working. Um, and I'm kind of doing the same technique here where I'm leaning two on each other so that it's more stable. And I would say if the first two or three modules are most important for stability and balance, the top module is the most important for just visual effect. How does the sculpture end? What's the last viewpoint? Is it clunky and unresolved? Or does it have like a nice module sticking off the edge? You can make more if you need to. So if you wanna make it taller or you want individual sticks kind of sticking out of it, kind of go and make as you progress through the sculpture. You might start out with 10 modules. You might end up with 20. You might only use eight. It really just depends on how large your sculpture is and what your end goals are. No, it doesn't look like much from this view. You're probably thinking, are you sure you're done? It doesn't look like much. I promise I will show it from a more refined view. As the top dries, now I did hold it in place long enough so it's not fragile. I'm going to go ahead and paint the base and do some touch-ups. This is where you'll find out too um, how much hot glue you used. Hot glue, to be honest, looks kind of ugly when painted over. So make sure when you're using the hot glue that you're really paying attention to, do you have lots of drips? Do you have like the hangy strings of hot glue? And I'm just going in with my black and the dried areas of hot glue, they dry clear, but I'm just touching them up with black acrylic paint so they're opaque and really match the sculpture. I can see my glue marks, but I do feel comfortable. I feel like I controlled it for the most part. There are some areas I probably could have used less glue, but I was trying to find that balance of it not being ugly or unrefined, but it also being stable. Again, we're doing double time here. You don't need to sit and watch me in real time paint every little nook and cranny of my sculpture. Just rotate your sculpture, look at it from all angles, really get in the cracks and crevices so it's all one solid color to create unity and to cover up any weird spots with your hot glue. I'm going to take things up a notch. You can see my sculpture on the side now. And again, I will do a better video at the end of that. And I would like to give my sculpture a little bit more visual interest. Now, if you're a true minimalist, you are thinking, what? Why would you add anything to this sculpture if it's all about just shapes, basic forms? So if you're a true minimalist and you like things simple, you can stop here. I'm gonna splatter on some white paint using two paintbrushes. Dip your smaller brush in the water that will loosen the bristles, but the paint will go flying. Notice I have covered my table. I highly recommend wearing an apron or an old t-shirt. You can kind of see my sculpture better here when it's on its edge. And I found that was the easiest way to kind of get the surface because if you're doing it from the top, it's just gonna hit the top part. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of rotating my sculpture. I'm doing my splatter technique where I put paint on one paintbrush and I tap it against another. You can tap it against a ruler, a pencil, a marker, or another paintbrush until the paint kind of flings in the way that you would like. You can also streak it with spray paint. So if you have spray paint, just not enough to cover like a ton of sculptures, you can just do a few little swipes of accent colors with the spray paint too. And that'd be a fun way to just add some visual interest to your sculpture. Again, if you're a minimalist, you're probably thinking why, but I just think it gives it more visual interest and it kind of covers up any oopsies that I made. If I did a bad job hot gluing, if things look kind of iffy, and I just think it's fun. Everything's so structured and geometric, having a little bit of paint splash on here is really bringing me joy. All right, here's my finished version and forgive my beautiful camera work where I'm just holding my phone in one hand and rotating the sculpture with the other. So you can see the paint splatter is really elevated. It is structurally sound. It's interesting from all sides. And here are some of my student in progress pictures. You can see they've already have them painted. Most of them are constructed. We're doing the paint splatter next week. So you'll have to check out my Instagram account for those finished projects. But you can see that the students um, showed a lot of creativity. Um, it's funny because they're all so different, even though the expectations were exactly the same. 
Thank you so much for sticking around and making art with me. And if you're interested in more sculpting tutorials, check these out. Also find me on Instagram at thatartteacher underscore machado to see what my students are up to in the classroom.